Uh, I'd like to introduce Guy Lecher, who was a student of Charles's, but actually I was on her defense committee when she did her, when she, when, when she did her dissertation here. I just have one story I want to tell uh, about Gila and me. We were once went over to Broadway and she was going to her car and she left her keys in the car. But never fear, Levi is here. He knew how to break it up, break open that car, which I did with an efficiency that amazed me. I, I didn't understand how I did it. Gila was impressed and I was impressed too. But in any case, we now have uh, Gila to speak for us. Thank you. Okay, so first, thanks Isaac for the introduction. And I'd like to say that although I've been a student of Charles, uh, I was really influenced by Isaac too. In my first year at Columbia, I took a seminar with Charles on the philosophy of logic and with Isaac and epistemology. And uh, it was based on the enterprise of knowledge. And I think it was a very big, made a very big impression on me. And uh, let me say about Charles, uh, like I think many of the students here, the former students here, I came to Columbia to work with Charles and I did it based on his work that I knew before I came, that I knew from Israel. And um, I think there was something in his papers that really appealed to me, some kind of depth and integrity and subtlety and there was like the co constant presence of Kant in his thinking, even about things different from Kant. And uh, I thought before I, ca I, I came here, I thought, what was some, say, three distinctive uh, experiences that I had with him as a student? And I thought I'll mention uh, uh, the following. First, uh, I think like we all feel, Carl, uh, um, uh, Charles has an enormous, uh, uh, gave me an enormous sense of philosophical integrity. And uh, it was something I really respected and used as a model. But also I had the feeling that in, in a sense, I'm in good hands that uh, Working with Charles, there's no way that my own dissertation will lack philosophical integrity. That's something I don't have to worry about. So that was one aspect. Uh, the second aspect was um, Charles somehow had an enormous feeling for me. And when I wanted to do my dissertation, I wanted to do something in the philosophy of logic, something that will be foundational and basic. But it is well known that it's extremely difficult to find a way to go into the foundation of logic. How do you get there? How do you start? And I didn't know how to do it until one way Charles told me just out of the blue, you know, Gila, there's this paper by uh, Mostovsky and a generalization of quantifiers. Maybe you should look at it. Maybe you like it. And I look at it and it just opened my eyes and suddenly I found a question which was on the one hand a very definite question, what are the logical constants? And on the other hand went into the heart of the question, what is logic? And so immediately I wrote a paper and Charles and, Bo and I both agreed this would be the topic of my dissertation. And I had the defense and Isaac was there and uh, also Wilfred was there, the prospectus defense. But then the question was, okay, so I have a good question, but how do I answer he it? How do I <laughs> decide which are the logic, right logical constants? I never trusted my intuitions or gut feelings. I sort of, that wasn't what I was looking for. I was looking for a rational reason, but w how do you get it? And I almost thought that maybe, okay, my dissertation will be just posing a question and that might be enough. Until Charles again one day told me, you know, Gila, there's uh, this guy, this PhD student in Stanford who wrote an interesting dissertation. You might want to write to him and ask him to send it to you. And that was Janet Chemendi. And Janet Chemendi sent me his dissertation as his dissertation says, well, logic, uh, th th there's no justification for logic. Not for task and logic, uh, not, not for logic at all. It works by chance, uh, if it works at all. And this seemed to me so wrong. 
And again, it opened my eyes. And by thinking about the way that uh, Janet Chimendi was wrong, I found a way to understand the kind of things that were relevant to answering my question. So I've never done this for my students. I wish I could, but Charles was really amazing in this way for me. And finally, I would like to say that about a sort of how we interacted at Columbia. So we never hung around. Uh, I didn't hang around with anyone because I had two little kids at home and I studied, I lived in New Jersey, so I just come to do what I had to do and went back home. And as far as I could tell, Charles didn't hang out with students either. And so, um, uh, the way we would work is I would write a paper in the beginning and later a chapter of my dissertation and I'll give it to him and then he will write critical comments and then I will get the comments and I'll think about him and then I will make a meeting and I will come to my office uh, to his office and I would defend my ideas and that was it that was every meeting and in the end we decided whether I have to make changes or it was okay and it was almost Spartan there was no small talk, no personal talk, no talk about other issues in philosophy. But it was so great that it really was an, a, a wonderful thing for me. And I'd like to say also one word, a, a few words about Charles' own work. Uh, since I came to Colombia, uh, Charles has done work in new fields that uh, uh, he didn't work on before, and especially, I think, developed a view of um, mathematical structuralism and uh, also his work on reason, which was extremely important for me. And I feel that if I had to choose now where to go to do my graduate study and he had not retired, I would have had even more reason to go and work with him. But there is one thing I feel I never really wrote about Charles and I never even cited him in any of my papers and I feel a little bit bad about this. But uh, I thought about it, why is it so? And there were a few times when I developed ideas and I thought, oh, this is connected in some way to Charles' ideas, why don't I point it out? But then I thought, when I started to actually look and try to do it, I always felt that I just cannot do it. His views on every issue are so subtle, so rich, so precise that I just cannot use it as a means to further my own views. Uh, if I do that, I'll just distort what he did. And so I never could do it, and I'm really sorry, and I won't do it in this uh, um, uh, talk too. I mean, it's not that it's impossible. There were so many wonderful examples here of people who did relate and did uh, connect with him in, his, in, in their work, but I just never yet succeeded in doing it. But I did choose a topic that I think uh, is of great interest to Charles, and that's mathematical truth. And in thinking about it, I also came to think about another relation that I think is of it interest to him, and that's the relation between posits and reality. Okay, so now I'll start. But my notes fell down, so let me see. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. And I assume this will work. I need to put it. <laughs> what? Oh, it's working. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> the difficulties encountered by existent theories of mathematical truth, difficulties that emanating, largely emanating from the abstract nature of mathematics and its objects, have led some philosophers to question whether truth is applicable to mathematics at all. I'm not talking here about a deflationist understanding of mathematical truth. I'm talking about a substantive understanding, an understanding that of the kind where to understand the workings of truth in a field of knowledge X 
requires understanding something basic, central, informative, explanatory about X, something that goes to the heart of both truth and X. And I've written about my conception of a substantive theory of truth in a number of papers, and one of them is In Search of a Substantive Theory of Truth in a Journal of Philosophy 2004. Okay, now uh, in setting out to investigate, investigate a widely studied subject matter, we need to give some thought for our starting point. My starting point in investigating truth in mathematics will diverge from some of the prevalent approaches in a few ways. First, discussions of mathematical truth often center on unrelati relatively small units of cognition, like sentences, 7 plus 5 equals 12, and terms, the numeral 7. In contrast, I will start by considering the discipline of mathematics as a whole. So I'm not going to talk about linguistic units, but what is mathematics ab about, and is, does it have anything to be true about? And um, second, I will start with an extremely basic question. I think a question which is on everyone's mind, but it's very, quite rarely found in actual works, uh, uh, contemporary works. Is there anything in the world for mathematics to be true or false of? Is there anything in the world such that to obtain knowledge of the world, we need to develop a discipline like mathematics to study it? And third, when thinking about mathematical correspondence, it is common to focus on mathematical objects. And I would say, because I'm thinking about mathematical truth in terms of the world, it'll be something in the neighborhood of mathematical correspondence. But when people think about mathematical correspondence, it is common to, to, to focus on mathematical objects, where the paradigm of a mathematical object is a numerical individual, say the individual seven. In contrast, I will focus on the reality of mathematical features of objects, objects of any kind, uh, in the world in a broad sense of world, and I will call the such features seven that will be the second level property, cardinality property seven. And thus, I will ask the above question in the form, do objects and their properties in general have mathematical features? That will be uh, my approach. Now, um, oh, I should go forward. OK. So uh, I think that there are a few advantages to, to this approach. And one of them, by treating mathematics as a discipline, I gain a very broad perspective. I gain a perspective uh, concerning the role of mathematics in our system of knowledge. For example, is mathematics a genuine branch of knowledge or is it just an instrument uh, to be used for acquiring physical knowledge? By looking, uh, by looking at the world, starting with the world that mathematics studies, uh, I can have a sense of whether mathematical truth is correspondence or not. If the world has mathematical features, if objects in the world have mathematical features, then it's reasonable to think of mathematical truth as of the correspondence kind, rather than based on some kind of correspondence, rather than a language or convention or something like this. And by looking at focusing on features, by focusing on features, the microphone, <laughs> but by focusing on features rather than on objects, rather than on individuals, I am gaining a wider basis of a, an account of mathematical truth. First, I avoid problems with the existence of abstract individuals, problems that I think were very important in dissuading many philosophers to become anti-realist with, with respect to mathematics. And second, 
uh, I can communicate with a larger uh, 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 community of philosophers. I can even communicate with philosophers who are nominalists with regard to <coughs> individuals. I don't have to start with abstract individuals. And by approaching uh, uh, truth in this way, uh, one of the results is that I avoid both the extreme extremes of Platonism and empiricism. By starting with regular individuals, individuals in the world like you and, and me, I avoid Platonism. And by starting by allowing that regular objects, physical objects, have abstract properties, abstract features, uh, properties, uh, uh, I avoid empiricism. So in this way, I feel that I can avoid uh, uh, avoid both problematic um, starting points. Okay. I think you went backward. I went backward? Yeah. Ah, okay, thanks. Okay, mathematics and, mathematics and the world, okay. Okay, uh, first I would say just a few words about terminology so there are no confusions. Uh, when I talk about word and reality, they are the same thing for me, no difference. When I talk about objects, sometimes I will talk in a narrow sense and sometimes in a broad sense. Uh, in a narrow sense, objects are like individuals or higher level things which are objects but not properties. When I talk in a broad sense, it will include properties, relations, and so on. And similarly, when I talk about features, features are like properties, relations, operations, and no difference between them. And so my initial observation is very simple. Objects in the world have properties of various kinds. They have biological, physical, psychological, many kinds of properties. The question is, do they have formal or mathematical properties. This is what I want to start with. And the way I look at formal properties are as structural, first in the intuitive sense that uh, structural or formal properties are sensitive to patterns and not to who the individuals are. And again, I tried to work with my own computer so the symbols will work well, but it is, didn't work out, so we won't have the symbols. But the, the idea is that identity is formal because all we care about is that we have pair of two things which are the same no matter what they are. And the cardinality too uh, is also a formal property because all we care that we have a set with two elements no matter what the elements are. So this is what makes them formal. Oh, I'm always going back. Well. Okay. Uh, so let's look at this. Let's ask the question, are there, do regular individuals have formal properties? Are there, does the world have formal properties? Well, let's look at the people in this room. I think it's quite clear. I mean, everyone will accept our reality, even most nominalists, we are real. And I think that among the many, many properties we have, it's quite clear that we have some formal properties. For example, each one of us is identical to him or herself. Uh, let's look at our properties, first level properties of people in this room. Uh, take the property X is in this room. This is a physical simple property and yet this property itself has formal, a formal feature, formal property. It is a fact about the reality of this physical room that there are more than 10 of us rather than less than 10 of us and that's a formal feature of this reality. Uh, let's le look at relations between us. Uh, we are s b all sitting, each one of us sits in the same room as the other. Sitting in the same room as is a physical property but it has formal features. It's reflexive, it's symmetric and it's not transitive. So, uh, uh, and, and more than that, there are many kind of formal operations that 
operate on our physical properties. Take the properties X is a speaker and X is a woman. This is a, X is a speaker is a, is a property of me and everyone who spoke here. And, but the complementation of this property is also a property of some people in the room. And so we use informal operation complementarity, complement in order to arrive at other properties or intersection. A woman speaker in the room. Uh, this is a, we can create, arrive at physical properties by um, a formal operations. Um, <coughs> So we do not need more than plain common sense uh, to make these observations. And it is not hard to see that denying these observations is quite difficult to defend. Suppose that neither we nor our properties have any formal features. What does this mean? It means that each of us is neither identical or different from ourselves and from others. It means that collections of people in this room have no size, that relation between us exhibit no formal features, uh, that our properties do not form unions and intersection, and so on. These claims are quite unreasonable. So if we are real, and if we have the first level properties and relations mentioned above, and if these properties and relations have the second level properties noted above, then objects in the world, in the broad sense, do have formal features, and such features are real. In the absence of any compelling challenge to the existence of people in this room, to their our having first level properties like self-identity, and to their our properties having second level properties like cardinality, the above consideration suggests the reality of formal features just in the way that other common sense considerations suggest the reality of physical and biological and many other kinds of features. But if these formal features are real, that is part of the reality of this room, then it is reasonable to produce, to, to presume that these features exhibit some regularities and are governed by some laws. And laws of cardinalities, laws of identities. And if this is the case, then if we want to know the world, we want to know these laws. Part of knowing the, the world is knowing these features and knowing the laws that govern them. So even if we start as nominalists with respect to individuals, it is difficult for us to deny <coughs> uh, that things in the world have formal features and that we humans want to study them. And in order to study them, we need our system of knowledge to include some branch or branches of knowledge that study just these features and the laws that govern them. OK, so the question is, uh, which discipline studies these laws? And a natural, re reasonable answer, or first answer, is mathematics. Uh, suppose not. Well, that, I think, would be uh, quite absurd. And let me, uh, um, let me elaborate uh, on this a little bit. So does mathematics fit this job descri description? Some would give a negative answer to this question. They might say that mathematics is purely conventional, that its job is to set forth formal conventions based on pragmatic considerations, and that if it studies anything, what it studies are just such conventions. Or they might say that mathematics is too general and too abstract to engage with the real world, that it is interested in the formal for its own sake, whether it is real, part of reality or not, and so on. 
Mathematical <coughs> conventionalism, however, is highly problematic for reasons I discuss elsewhere and also many other people have discussed. And in the absence of co a compelling defense of this doctrine, it is reasonable to pursue other options. As far as the claim that mathematics is interested in the formal independently of reality, first I would like to note that mathematics is a broad and diverse discipline with multiple goals and interests. The question is whether one of the central things it does is study the laws governing the formal features of reality, not whether this is the only thing it does. Second, the view that mathematics is not interested in reality is quite unreasonable. Consider cardinality. We have seen that properties of individuals in the world have cardinalities. We know that mathematics has theories of cardinalities, arithmetic set theory. Since these theories can be unified, we can talk about the, math the mathematical theory of cardinality. The question is, does or at least ought the mathematical theory of card cardinality encompass real cardinalities, i.e. the cardinalities of actual or potential objects in the world? Should its laws, what it says are the laws of cardinality, be real laws of real cardinality? Now, a negative answer to this question would be quite unreasonable. It would be quite unreasonable to say that properties in the world have cardinalities, these cardinalities are governed by formal laws, mathematicians know about these cardinalities and believe they are governed by such laws, yet they study or ought to study exclusively other laws, laws governing unreal made-up cardinalities, laws that have nothing to do with cardinalities in the world. It would be quite strange, for example, if mathematics studied finite cardinalities, but the laws it said governed such cardinalities differed from the laws governing real finite cardinalities, if in saying 1 plus 1 equals 2, mathematics had in mind some unreal cardinalities, cardinalities that had no systematic connection with the cardinalities of properties and of actual and potential objects in the world. Okay, so another claim that someone might say only applied mathematics, not pure mathematics, has to do with the world. My answer is that first, applied mathematics requires a non-applied mathematics in order to apply it. And second, the task of formulating the laws governing real formal properties in order to formulate the laws governing real formal properties in complete generality and systematicity this job requires something on the order of pure mathematics. Uh, I will give Anne an explanation of this later on when I will talk about the modal force of mathematics and the large ontology of mathematics. But the idea is that the mathematical properties are in certain way very special. They have very special features that in order to studying the, study them in complete generality, we need to go into to have, uh, um, we need to have something on the order of pure mathematics. Now, if mathematical theories or some mathematical theories are theories of the laws governing the formal features or formal behavior of objects in the world, then these theories or significant parts of these theories are true or false in the correspondent sense broadly understood. If and to the extent that the laws of, say, our current arithmetic theory are directly or indirectly but in a systematic manner the laws governing the relation between finite cardinalities in the world, then current arithmetic is true to reality. In other words, if and to the extent that 
Karen arithmetic or set theory is committed to a correct description of the laws governing real cardinalities, then its standard of truth is a correspondent standard in the common sense, in the common sense sense. I'm not talking about strict idea of a correspondent standard. This, however, does not mean that the correspondence between mathematical truth and reality is direct. It is an open question how, in what manner, using what pattern, true mathematical theories do or might correspond to reality, what the root of mathematical correspondence is. To understand mathematical truth is to figure out what this root is or might be like. So that's what I would like to go to next. But before I go and uh, continue, uh, there is a puzzle that arises. If, as it appeared to be, formality lies largely on the second level, why is much of mathematics first order? Let me elaborate a little bit. Our analysis suggests that the level at which cardinalities, say, arise in reality is the level of properties of properties. But in modern arithmetic and set theory, cardinalities are individuals. Why does mathematics study cardinalities, which are second level properties, by means of first order theories like Peano arithmetic and ZFC, which construe them as individuals? This puzzle has two sides. From one perspective, the question can be formulated as follows. If cardinalities are in fact second level properties, how can first order arithmetic and set theory get things right? How can an arithmetic theory which treats cardinalities as individuals be said to correspond to reality? From the opposite perspective, the puzzle is this. If in the world there are no cardinal individuals and only but only second level cardinal properties. Why do mathematicians construct their theories of cardinalities as theories of individuals? Why do they treat cardinalities as individuals if in fact they are properties of properties? Why not opt for higher order mathematics? Now, the main issue for the present investigation is not historical or biological or psychological or social. The main, I the main issue is, is it possible in principle to account for second level phenomena by first order theories? This is the question as I see it. And I think the answer is yes so long as constraints of accuracy and consistency are satisfied. How? Uh, for example, uh, as expressed by the following conjecture, one possibility would be, oh, actually, before that, I'd like to read something before I get to this. Uh, <coughs> I say that the answer is yes. We can explain account for second level phenomena by first order theories in general. How? Uh, it ap there appears to be no problem. It, we can do it in the same way that we can use a, a, that a skyscraper built of steel, concrete, and glass can be accurately represented by a small plastic model. In the same way, higher level objects and their laws can, in principle, be accurately represented by other kinds of objects, for example, lower level objects and their laws. First order theories are capable, in principle, of correctly describing second level objects and their laws if we allow indirect correspondence. And this principle would be realized if something like the following conjecture holds. Suppose we humans work better with individuals, work, I mean, cognitively better with individuals and their properties than with properties and their properties. Suppose we 
get confused and cannot figure out things well when we think in terms of higher level properties. But with individuals, we really work very easily and we can figure out things and see connections very easily. So they or we can posit an ontology of mathematical individuals to work with. And question, regardless of explanation, as I said, I'm not looking for an actually correct biological or historical explanation. I would like to see that it is easy to find a reasonable explanation of some reasonable explanation for this phenomenon. Uh, the question is, how can this actually be done? And what is the resulting notion of mathematical truth? To answer this question, I need to explain a little bit about my general conception of truth. Uh, I um, express it uh, in, as I mentioned before, the paper I published in the Journal of Philosophy and quite a few other papers. Okay, so let's go to truth and the basic situation. In thinking about truth uh, in the present context, I'm thinking about four factors that affect our standard of truth for theories of the world, not just mathematical theories. One is the complexity of the world. That makes the task of constructing a standard of truth more difficult. Second, in spite of the, the fact that the world appears to us to be very complex, we humans are very ambitious. And we want to know and understand the world in all its complexity. That again makes it difficult to find a standard of truth. Third, we are limited creatures. And the limitations of our mind are an obstacle for such an enormous task, complicated task. So this again complicates the task. But there is one a, a, a positive element here, and this is that in spite of our limitations, we do have a very intricate cognitive capacities. And we can use these capacities in order to obtain knowledge of the world and in order to create a standard of truth for our theories. Okay, I'm supposed to read here something, but I don't see it. Oh, slide, yeah. Now, one to three generates uh, the problem that if the world is highly complex relative to our cognitive capacities, uh, 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 relatively complex, highly complex relative to our cognitive capacities. And if we nevertheless seek to know it in full complexity, then this requires stretching our cognitive endowments, devising multiple means for reaching its less accessible regions, improvising, experimenting, tinkering, exercising our imagination, etc., in devising ways of coming to know this complicated world given our uh, limitations on the one hand and whatever capacities we happen to have on the other. And our intricate cognitive capacities, I think, make this feasible. As a result, it's quite likely that we use a wide variety of routes to reach the world cognitively. And some of these are complex, indirect, jagged. What this means for the study of truth is that it's seriously possible that there are mul multiple routes of correspondence between true cognitions and reality, and that some of these routes are quite intricate. This possibility concerns language as well. A proper use of, say, a singular term need not target an individual in the world. 
it may target, target something else, say a property of individuals, a property of property of individuals, that for one reason or another, we reach through the use of a singular term and possibly an intermediate pos posited individual that is systematically connected to it. Given this possibility, it is an open question what form correspondence takes in different areas of knowledge, and it's unreasonable either to assume or to require that it take the form of a copy or a mirror image or even isomorphism. At the same time, it's also the case that in seeking knowledge of the world and in developing theories of various aspects of the world, we aim at unity and systematicity. How then do we go about developing our theories of the formal aspect of reality? That depends on how our cognitive apparatus works. And here the above conjecture comes into play. Suppose we are so wired that we work more effectively when we deal with systems of individuals than with systems of higher level objects. Suppose the most natural or effective way for us to make discoveries and develop theories of any subject matter or of a formal subject matter or some formal subject matters is to do it on the first level. We humans may be better at discovering formal regularities and constructing systematic theories of such regularities when we think of them as involving individuals than higher level properties. Our cognitive tools may work better in a first level setting than in a higher level setting. Now, if reality does not supply us with a first level formal setting, then one of the things we can do using our intricate cognitive capacities is exercise what I call epistemic freedom and create a first level setting for studying the formal by ourselves. We can use our imagination, creativity, ability to figure out relations between phenomena, etc., to construct a first level model in the everyday sense of model of reality or of those parts, aspects of reality we wish to study. This enables us to develop a first order arithmetic theory that gives a correct, albeit indirect, account of cardinalities in the world. Arithmetic, in that case, describes the laws governing cardinalities by describing laws governing their first level simulations. The key idea is that while the subject matter of mathematics or of significant parts of mathematics is external, i.e. mathematics seeks to discover formal laws governing reality, Mathematics is a discipline created by and for humans. As such, it might, re it might reach the world in ways that are advantageous for humans, but circuitous from the point of view of correspondence. Such a correspondence can be as accurate and systematic as direct correspondence in spite of its roundabout nature. Laws of arithmetic and set theory may not be connected to reality through the same route as the laws of other sciences, yet that might be as deeply connected to it as more direct laws. How would humans go about constructing first order theories of higher level cardinalities? Okay, so here let me go to uh, be a little more concrete and see how this can be done. Figuratively, we can represent this as follows. Uh, let me start with reference. Uh, usually we talk about direct reference, and direct reference is one layered. Here we have, in, on the level of language, we have names of level zero, for example, the numeral one, and it denotes an object on the le of a level zero in the world, the individual one. Uh, we have a predicate on a level one even, and it denotes a property of level one even. 
But reference can also be two-layered, and a two-layered reference will have the following uh, form. First, it will have three components, language, posits, and reality. Names will, of level zero will denote individuals of level zero and the level of posits, but they would be systematically, would systematically represent second level properties. Here it will be the second level property one. Similarly, predicates of level one will denote directly uh, properties of level one, posited properties of level one, which systematically represent real properties in the world of level three. And I should notice that something uh, like this was suggested one by Harold Hodes in a paper about Frege but it was in a quite different context. Now, traditional correspondence theory disregards the possibility of using our cognitive resources to reach reality in this way. As a result, it limits us to a single monolithic pattern of correspondence, the same for all first order truth. And this in turn pressures us to renounce correspondence altogether whenever the standard pattern fails to work. But by taking into account the resourcefulness, flexibility, conceptual capacities, imagination, and other human skills, we see at once that we can change the original pattern and adapt it to our needs. And one available type of adaptation is postulation of a new class of objects or an auxiliary stratum of reality. Two examples of correspondence based on this principle are the following. Take the two um, first order sentences. Two plus seven is nine. And for every M and N, M plus N equals N plus M. A composite correspondence, uh, the first one, the arithmetic sentence, 2 plus 7 equals 9 is true, if and only if, on the level of posits, uh, applying the operation of addition uh, to the two individual numbers, 2 and 7, uh, results in 9. If and only if, on the level of reality, disjoint union of two, the second level properties, two and seven, is nine. And here I gave a second order representation of this condition. The second sentence, the symmetry of addition is true if and only if, on the level of posits, the operation of addition is symmetric. If and only if, on the level of reality, disjoint a, a union is symmetric. Now, one might suspect that there is an element of circularity or infinite regress in our account, since in order to state the truth conditions of mathematical statements, in this example, arithmetic statements, we assume we already have the truth conditions of mathematical statements, in this example, set theoretical statements. This brings us to another feature of our approach, or brings me to another feature of my approach, and that's holism, which sanctions a certain measure of circularity. I will discuss my holistic approach below. Here, however, let me just say that as far as I can see, my holistic approach is very different from the holistic approach that, for example, Michael Friedman associates with crying and sharply criticized, criticizes. It is important to indicate that a systematic connection between first and second level truth conditions of mathematical statements does not mean reduction or translatability to an equivalent theory. Although we can translate first order number statements to second order number statements, first order arithmetic is not equivalent to second order arithmetic. First order arithmetic has a logically complete proof system, while second order uh, arithmetic does not. Second order arithmetic is categorical, while first order arithmetic is not. The two are not equivalent, yet they are systematically connected. Speaking objectually, 
the posited stratum of mathematical individuals need not be fully reducible to a non-posited layer of reality. In a sense, the posited stratum has a life of its own. Once the basic structure of a lower level model of the formal features of reality is in place, the road is open for the lay as well as the theoretical mathematician to utilize it in study, studying these features and in particular their laws. That is, once the representational adequacy in principle of the posited stratum is accepted, we proceed as if mathematical truth were based on simple direct correspondence with this posited stratum. It was thus by taking seriously the, pictures of, the picture of sets as individuals that mathematicians made a quantum leap in their understanding of the hierarchy of sets, a hierarchy involving sets of higher and higher level. Studying the formal layer of reality indirectly in this way generates certain discrepancies, and it is our duty to recognize them, find ways to reconcile them, and see to it that no paradoxes are generated. But with the availability of cognitive maneuvers like ascent to a meta theory or a sideways step to a background theory or metaphorically shifts in position a north boat, this can in principle be done. We can identify with considerable precision the relation between first and second order arithmetic we can structure the network of connections between posited cardinality individuals and cardinality properties of different levels in a sufficient, sufficiently intricate way to prevent paradox and so on. All these make a composite connection between mathematics and the world not just a viable option, but also a feasible one. Responding to the skeptic, we will say, twisting the catchy title of a book by my colleague Nancy Cartwright, that if you know how to connect them to reality, the laws of mathematics do not lie. Okay. Now I'm getting uh, to uh, advantages of the present account of mathematical truth. Well, first and most importantly, it gives us, I think, a substantive explanatory account of mathematical truth as correspondence. But in addition, I think it allows us to give solutions to many problems with traditional conceptions of mathematical truth as correspondence and of mathematical realism. Um, one should be clear, as for two, our composite account of mathematical correspondence, along with our holistic approach to truth and knowledge, enable us to solve, or at least make significant progress toward solving, a wide range of problems uh, for mathematical realism and correspondence, as well as related problems. This includes the identity problem, Benasserov, the application problem, Wigner and Steiner, the modal force problem, the large ontology problem, the cognitive access problem, again, Benasserov, and others. In discussion, discussing these issues, I will have to be very short, so I will give no more than a very brief sketch. Okay, let's look at the identity problem. The problem, very si simplifying, can be said, so Melos 2 is one thing, Weinoyman 2 is another thing, which is the real 2. And for us, the solution is simple. They are both different but equally good posits. I mean, there's in the same way that you can have many good models of, say, a skyscraper, you can have very good many good models of cardinality properties. Or that is different but equally good representations of the second level formal property too. 
Now, someone might, might ask, should we say then that the real two is the second level property two? Well, we have proposed an account of mathematical truth which shows that at least prima facie, there is something for mathematical theories to be true about in the sense of correspondence, and it is possible to construct a model of mathematical correspondence. Now, in the example of a model we used, we used above, the real two is indeed the second level two. But since this is just one possible model based on our general principles, it is possible that there is another model in which the second level two is not the real two, and we are leaving it an open question what the other options are, what the real two actually is, and whether there is a single real two. We can say that from an imminent perspective, the answer is positive from the perspective of our model, two, real two is a second level two. But from a transcendent perspective, a perspective external to the model we delineated, the question is open. The application problem, uh, um, due to mathematics' highly abstract nature, its applicability to the empirical world is traditionally considered difficult to explain. And I give this famous citation, the enormous usefulness of mathematics in the general, in the natural science is something bordering on the mysterious. There is no rational explanation for it. Wigner, 1960. This problem is especially difficult for traditional adherents of mathematical correspondence who are often Platonists, and in particular for those who postulate two separate reality, the one abstract, the other physical. It is hard to use, to, it is hard to see how mathematical laws which govern a Platonic reality apply to a radically different mundane physical reality. This problem, however, does not arise for our approach. First, our approach assumes only one reality. Second, it connects mathematics with formal features of objects, not with the existence of mathematical individuals, that is, ma uh, formal features of objects in general. Third, it holds that reality has both physical and formal features, and fourth, it says that formal features are had by objects of many kinds, including, as I said, physical objects and their physical properties. As a result, the applicability of mathematics to, to physics is quite straightforward. Indeed, the abstractness of formal properties makes it easier rather than more difficult to apply them and the laws governing them to objects of all kinds. Abstract properties abstract from, that is, disregard most features of their bearers. And this means that they themselves do not notice the difference between their physical and abstract bearers. Thus, cardinality properties treat collections of physical objects just like connect collections of abstract objects, and for that reason, they can apply equally and to the same, in, in the same way to both. Okay, here I will not read anymore. I would like to uh, get going quickly, so I'll talk very briefly. I'll start with the modal force problem. And I've written about this in more detail in a, a paper I've recently published, The Foundational Problem of Logic in the Bulletin of Symbolic Logic. Okay, so the problem is, uh, a few people say, uh, well, if mathematical truth is about the world, then it must be contingent. How can it be necessary? Oh, sorry. Uh, my response is not necessarily. Mathematical truth, <laughs> mathematical truth is truth about the formal laws governing reality, and it depends on the nature of formality 
whether these laws, laws in reality, are necessary or not. Now, uh, an structuralist conception of formality, as I just mentioned, formal properties and laws g at, uh, uh, pay attention only to patterns. They do not distinguish between individuals. That is, they do not notice one-to-one -one replacements of individuals. And this, I will argue, is the reason that the laws governing them are necessary. And let me go about uh, over this in a little bit more detail. Uh, if I speak in set theoretical term, then I would say that formality is, or I propose that formality is invariance under isomorphism. Property P is formal if and only if P is invariant under all isomorphisms of structures. Uh, let me give an example, two examples. Um, a cardina the cardina a cardinality property. Cardinality properties are formal. Why? Uh, there are properties of individuals. Uh, there are properties of properties of individuals. So set theoretically, the relevant structure is a universe A or a set A and a subset B of A. And we know that if you take any isomorphic structures A B and A prime B prime, then the cardinality in A of B or of the complement of B is X if and only if the cardinality in A prime of B prime or the complement of B prime is X. So cardinality properties are formal. An example of a property which is not formal, second level property, is uh, the property of being a property of human. This property is not formal because for some A, B, A prime, B prime, which such that the two structures are isomorphic, uh, the property B in A is a property of humans, while the property B prime in A prime is not a property of humans. For example, if A and B are uh, structures of humans and numbers, respectively. Now, modal force. Uh, <coughs> because uh, properties in general, as Tarski pointed out, uh, have a certain level of invariance. And different kinds of properties have a different degree of invariance. Now, mathematical properties, because they are invariant under all isomorphisms, have a relatively very strong level of invariance. And that means that they disregard more features of objects or situations than more weakly invi invariant properties, for example, physical properties. But that means that mathematical laws hold in an especially wide, ra wide range of counterfactual situation. Uh, all laws hold in counterfactual situation and cannot be fully described just with regard to their extension in uh, actual extension. Being a law means that if particulars over which they hold were different, then they still would hold if, uh, say, I wasn't here, and instead of me, my parents had another person, uh, a, 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 another child, that would make absolutely no difference either to the laws of physics or to the laws of cardinalities. But if physical objects became mathematical objects, then the laws of physics would not hold. But if physical objects became mathematical objects, the laws of cardinality would still hold because of their strong degree of invariance. And that means that mathematical laws hold in an especially wide range of counterfactual situation. And that means that their laws must have or have. That explains why their laws have an especially strong modal force. So I think it's the formality of mathematics, not the fact that it doesn't have to do with reality that explains the modal force of its laws. The large ontology problem. The problem is the large ontology of mathematical individuals. For us, this is not a problem. First, 
the individuals are positive, so what does it matter how many are there? But still, one may, might ask, why a large positive ontology? Can you theory explain why we need a large positive ontology? And the answer is yes. Large ontology is required in order to represent the formal laws in their full generality and model force. That's why. Because the individual numbers cannot stop at the number of objects that actually are now in the world. They have to go beyond that in order to capture the modal force of the arithmetic laws. And let me give two examples. One. To express the laws of natural numbers in their full generality, we need, or it is useful to posit, something on the order of a denumerable ontology of individuals. Otherwise, the laws would be the wrong laws. It doesn't have to be denumerable set theory. There may be other ways, but it has to go beyond just the arithmetic of uh, uh, finite objects that exist in the world. Two, once we use, and that is a second level, once we use a denumerable ontology of individuals to express the law of power set or power property cardinality, that is the power set of, uh, um, the cardinality of the power set of A is larger than the cardinality of A in complete generality and systematically, we need something on the order of an indenumerable ontology of individuals. So this enormous ontology of set theory is a tool that we use in order to represent correctly in terms that are accessible to us human. The enormous breadth and, uh, and modal force and counterfactual range of formal laws because of their nature. And this, I think, is at least how our, my account explains the uh, large cardinality problem. Finally, the last problem that I will talk about is the cognitive access problem. And the problem is, how can humans, uh, uh, humans access, access cognitively the formal or mathematical features of reality and the laws governing them? Now, this is a very serious problem for Platonists who have to explain the access from one reality to another, and also for radical empiricists who limit cognitive access to causal patterns. But it is not a, pro a big, I mean, it is a problem to work it out, but in principle, it's not a problem for us. Uh, three characteristics of, my, uh, of our approach, again, this is part of my approach that I will not be able to talk about in details here, um, which make access to abstract features and laws feasible are uh, epistemic holism, quasi a priority, and role of intellect. Now, by epistemic holism, I mean not the way sometimes holism is thought that uh, the smallest unit of knowledge, explanation, justification, is our system of knowledge as a whole. Not one unit holism. I think um, Damet and Glimo gave very good reasons against, the, uh, against it, and I also talked about it in some of my papers. What I do mean is our system of knowledge is a rich, open-ended cognitive network. And I would call this relational holism. Now, uh, for my conception of holism, I just wrote here, see a paper I published in Erkenntnis in uh, 2010, Epistemic Friction, Reflections on Knowledge, Truth, and Logic, and also in the Foundational Problem of Logic. Now, relevant features of my holism for the following, uh, uh, in, the following in the present context is, one, there are multiple connections in multiple directions between multiple disciplines. This is one of the standard features of holism. Two, again a standard feature, there is no Archimedean standpoint. Three, another standard feature, there is no automatic re rejection of circularity, and actually I sort of uh, talk about constructive circularity, but I won't be able to go into it here, sort of useful kinds of circularity. 
The fourth one, I think, is new relative to existent theories of holism, and that is what holism means for me is that instead of having this one rigid connection between knowledge and reality or between the basic parts of knowledge and the less basic parts, as in foundationalism, where the relation is very rigid, tree-like, there are multiple cognitive routes from mind to reality. There are many ways in which we can cognitively collect, connect to the world. And there are many ways in which we can establish all our theories. So now the combination of one and four is very powerful, I think. If there are many ways we can reach reality, that is both through intellect and through sense perception, and if we are allowed to use the resources of other disciplines that we have developed that magnifies our ability to reach reality, and I think it is this kind of combination that is used in understanding the formal structure of reality and the formal laws governing it. So speaking about the non-standard feature of my holism, multiple routes from mind to reality, what I have in mind is both direct routes and indirect routes, multiple resources for reaching the world, intellect is a resource for reaching the world, but that does not mean that its sensory perception is not, both are very important. There are numerous combinations of such resources. There's absolutely no reason to see, think that intellect must act independently and in isolation from perception. And there are multiple patterns of roots for mind to reality. Especially relevant is the role of intellect Intellect plays a major role in mathematical knowledge, but it is not required that intellect, act al that intellect alone can give us mathematical knowledge. This is tantamount to what I call quasi-a priorism. Now, there are many other people today who talk about some things uh, sort of uh, a priori, something that on the one hand, uh, wants to emphasize the importance of intellect, yet do not want to have rigid uh, a priorism. I think Stuart Shapiro and Michael Friedman and, and many others talk about this. I think all these make cognitive access to formal features in the world and the laws governing them feasible. Okay, uh, now I will go just really very briefly. I, I, I will just maybe just point out that I see connection of my conception of mathematics to other philosophical views to Aristotle, especially as interpreted by Jonathan Lear, to Frege, although with Frege there are also many differences, to Quine, although from Quine too there are many differences, and a fictionalist, Hartree Field, again, similarities, because we both think that theories do not have to refer to real objects in order to be good. We both reject Platonism. We both understand, uh, appreciate the uh, role of creativity in knowledge, but for Field, mathematical theories are false, and for us, if we know how to connect them to reality, they are true. Field has no interest in mathematics aside from science. And for us, uh, knowing the formal features of reality and the laws governing it, uh, them is just as important as knowing the physical features of reality and the laws governing them. We study mathematics mainly for its own sake, although also for helping other kinds of knowledge. And Field is a, um, is a mathematical nominalist and instrumentalist. And as I said, for me, mathematics is, mathematical knowledge is uh, valued uh, in its own right. Um, OK, Ofra, do you think I should go over the other things or better end now? Maybe I'll just go quickly about a few things. OK. Quine similarities. Like Quine, a uh, positing object is central to human knowledge. Here I'm like qu following Quine. Posits are not ipso facto unreal. Again, I accept it. And Quine also uh, advocated relational holism. Differences, 
Uh, in Quine, all objects are posits. That's not something I take as a given. Two, role of posits is purely pragmatic. For me, no. The important thing is that posits enable us to discover things about reality indirectly, not that ju just help us to construct convenient theories. And for Quine, mathematics' only role is service for science, indispensability. Again, as I said, this is not my view. And Quine sometimes advocates one unit holism as well, which I uh, reject. Uh, with Frege similarities, cardinalities, second level properties, very Fregean, mathematics is objection, ob objective, <laughs> close relation between logic and mathematics. This is something I didn't talk about here, but I think the root of both logic and mathematics is in the formal, and there's an interesting relation of how mathematics and logic develop in tandem in a holistic sort of something like, not double helix, but double bootstrap uh, uh, method, but cannot go into it here. And differences, a frege, and here I say something that a Yigal Bar-Ellis talk will uh, sort of um, show that maybe it's wrong. I said that Frege gives more, more weight to language as a key to ontology. For Frege, if we, have, if we have numerals, they have to denote mathematical individuals, at least in the Dametian view, and I don't see it this way. Second, for Frege, mathematical truth is analytic in the traditional sense. I reject completely the analytic synthetic distinction, and I explained it in a paper that was also published published in the Journal of Philosophy in 1999, I think. Uh, uh, is there a place for philosophy in Quine's theory? Uh, though I don't reject the role of intellect at all. Um, Frege says the truth is unanalyzable. We have to take it as primitive. I think the opposite, and I explained it in my papers on truth. Truth is analyzable and explainable. And uh, uh, finally, with regard to logic and mathematics, although I follow Frege in seeing a close connection, it's a different connection. And um, if I go quickly to Aristotle, as Jonathan Lear uh, um, interpreted him, Aristotle says, obviously physical objects contain surfaces, volumes, lines, and points, and these are the subject matters of mathematics. The mathematician separates them, for in thought they are separable from motion, and it makes no difference, no, nor does any falsity result if they are separated. They are objects, they have many kinds of properties. We can separate these properties and study them. And Aristotle even says, and uh, um, uh, in this, uh, I, at least in this translation, the best way of studying such features would be to separate and posit what is not separate in reality as the mathematician does and the geometer. And in Jonathan Lear's wor uh, words, uh, for, our, for Aristotle, mathematics is true not in virtue of the existence of separated mathematical objects to which its terms refer, but because it accurately describes the structural properties and relations which actual physical objects do have. Uh, unlike Aristotle, I don't, it is an open question for me whether all objects or individuals in the world are physical and not abstract. This is another open question. But still, it is enough that we accept physical objects in order to get uh, to mathematics. Thank you. Uh, when you, the very early part of your exposition, I thought I could hear echoes of Bertrand Russell, two features of Bertrand Russell. One, the slogan that transposed to mathematics, logic is about the real world just as truly as zoology, right. only about its more abstract and general features. And second, thinking in terms of uh, uh, type structure. Uh, uh, I think I'd 
But as you go on, I'd rather take it as a kind of commentary on Russell's slogan, that it represents a kind of starting point, but because of the complexity of our cognitive capacities, uh, uh, when mathematics certainly goes beyond what uh, in this logical edifice that uh, Russell built will, uh, will describe. Now, that's all very fascinating. Uh, I have two worries. Uh, the first one has certainly been expressed as a, uh, a criticism of wine. You mentioned as a uh, claim of wine that is not part of your view that uh, mathematics, so to speak, is so integrated with natural science uh, that he has a very reserved attitude toward uh, mathematics that uh, uh, goes beyond what's applicable in science or what uh, mm -hmm. is at all directed, directly connected with what you call the formal features of reality. Uh, I wonder if you uh, aren't committed to some view like that, even if, uh, anyway, and what, uh, what is your view able to say about higher set theory, uh, uh, particularly uh, the aim to get, just go ascend higher and higher into the infinite and continue to obtain mathematical results. So that's one worry. Uh, the second worry um, is one uh, that I'm sure would be expressed by Bill Tate if you he were here. And I think he could, would probably have it expressed it better than I. Uh, you put so much emphasis on cardinality that uh, one doesn't see how you uh, the, so to speak, most salient application of mathematics in natural science uh, is continuous mathematics. And there you come against very fuzzy aspects of, uh, of reality and the formal features that our mathematical theories deal with are, uh, it, it's not evident that they're formal theory formal features of uh, the reality that the theories are about. Uh, although people disagree about whether reality is inherently fuzzy. fuzzy. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think, I mean, I, I think perhaps that Wigner's problem about the applicability of mathematics was somewhat different from what you were talking about. But since <coughs> Mark Steiner has gone into that with some depth, and I haven't. I think he should have the chance to come in on that if he wants to. Okay, so I, I, I'll try to answer uh, 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 briefly the two questions about the uh, higher order, uh, higher levels of set theory uh, and then of other parts of mathematics that don't seem to fall so neatly under this, uh, my model. Um, with regard to higher order, uh, 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 higher levels of set theory, so I think this is an extremely interesting case epistemologically and especially for my approach. As I mentioned, uh, as I gave the example of the simple, uh, the two sort of earlier uh, lower level cases before, first in a uh, denumerable infinite uh, uh, ontology of numbers of finite cardinalities, and then in the numerable cardinality of um, of uh, um, um, of power sets th that results in trying to it to express in complete generality the power set principle. So now, first, this leaves uh, this moves us already 
to all the, the levels of set theory which can be obtained by the power set principle. Because when we get to a certain uh, in the numerable ont uh, ontology, say Aleph 1, then we apply the same principle to it and we get higher and higher and higher uh, 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 sets or ontologies. And so in this way, uh, at least all this part of set theory is captured by my, my account. But there are also today questions about whether we should not, if we want to talk about the whole uh, uh, universe of sets, whether we should not go, we don't need to go really beyond that. And I think that from my point of view, uh, this question is, is, has, has many dimensions. Okay, first, although I think about knowledge in general as being primarily about truth, about reality, I think that pragmatic considerations do play a very important role in building our theories. That is because uh, we are unable just by looking for the truth, uh, solve all the problems, but we still want to, co to construct theories, so there has to be a pragmatic element in them. I think as that, as Quine said in his paper, Ankarnap and Logical Truth, uh, we always want, in a way, to go to turn the conventional element into a factual element. That is, we start with conventions like hypotheses, and then we want to establish them, but it's clear that we cannot do it all the way. We'll never be able to. And so part of the question in set theory is what is the, the pragmatic question, is what is the best way to uh, think about set theory as a systematic uh, theory uh, in areas that we have very little access to uh, finding the truth about it. So this is one aspect. But I also think that uh, it is a, a possible that we uh, will find considerations that do have to do with truth and with facts that will uh, direct us, that will lead us to see that uh, the hierarchy does not add with the power set principle, but can go beyond it. And there are certain laws and certain regularities that to explain them in full generality, you have to go further. And uh, I must say that, you know, as far as the actual question, what should we do, I don't know. I mean, it's sort of left for the set theory, so uh, other people who work more closely on set theory to say. But I think that this is really a wonderful example where uh, the complexity of the human situation with regard to knowledge comes into a, a, a beautiful display. And when you talk about, a, a, say, when you talk about the continuum and an analysis and uh, areas of mathematics that are used in science in other ways, and you also raise the question of maybe the world is fuzzy and and uh, this is my view, maybe first I will say about uh, uh, whether the world is fuzzy. My view about logic is also that, you know, I think that the one sentence I like most in philosophy <laughs> is Wittgenstein's claim, look and see. I think that in knowledge, in general, in all areas, you have to look and see. Now, look and see in English uh, sounds a bit passive. But I think the look is something very active. You have to figure out how to look, where to look, use every opportunity that you have to actually look and so that you will see. And uh, I think it is really an open question whether the formal structure of reality is fuzzy or not. And if it is fuzzy, then yes, maybe we should ch replace our logic by fuzzy logic. And in some areas it is and others not, not. And if we do not replace it. We do have to find a way to uh, include descriptions of fuzzy areas of reality given our apparatus. And um, I would say the same thing about uh, the relation between physics and mathematics. I don't think that there's a sharp separation. I think there's a continuum in another part of this uh, paper, which I didn't uh, put on my slides, I talk about this idea of the difference between mathematics as a theory of the world and mathematics as algebra. I think Stuart Shapiro raised this distinction. 
And I think that when you think about mathematics as algebra, you think about mathematical theories as models that are realized in various, that could in principle be realized in very area, various areas of reality. And when you think about it as theory, you think about it maybe the intended model. But you can look at it as a theory in terms of models, and we can look at models as partial theories or potential theories. And you can also say that there are certain aspects of reality where we cannot sharply distinguish the formal and the physical. And these might be areas in which, as you say, those people who say that we cannot draw a sharp separation there uh, might find their place. So it's a very open question for me. And as I emphasized before, I don't want to say that this is all that mathematics does or the only thing it does. But I think mathematics does very important things concerning knowledge of reality and not just being an instrument, being indispensable to being an indispensable instrument for science. How much time do we have? We're very little. One more question. One more question. Yeah, so I have a, a question about, I, I, I think you were putting it forward as a hypothesis when you, I don't know how committed you feel to it, uh, this claim that we posit an ontology of mathematical uh, individuals to work with because the humans generally work better with these mm -hmm. uh, properties of properties. So I was wondering what you'd say about um, the fact that in, uh, there are plenty of cases where um, so Ger I think Gerdel maybe first pointed this out, and then uh, Boulos and others have written about it, where um, by, going to, by going to higher types, you actually can give proofs in a in very short number of steps compared to doing first order proofs, where there's no way you could give a proof even in the lifetime of you know, the existence of presumably of the universe right. with, well, with all the symbols that would be required. And so, um, so would that suggest that in some cases you should posit maybe second order or higher order uh, theories because those are easier to work with? They allow you to give proofs? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Uh, definitely. I mean, uh, when we want to uh, develop theories of formal uh, structure of reality, we need to do two different kind of things. On the one hand, we need to discover. And so we need to provide to create a setting in which we, given our capacities, are capable of work back in seeing connections between things, for example. And according to this conjecture, that would be the case with first order arithmetic. But absolutely, we want also to do other things. We want to prove claims. We want to have efficient proofs. We want to have proofs that we can a, a, a grasp, and while we are doing this, definitely we can take this level of posits and create a second level representation of it and work with it. So I think there's really freedom here, and my sense is that you know we use what we can when we come to when it comes to knowledge, and I think there's something that Isaac said in his uh, book, The Enterprise of Knowledge, that I really liked, and that is, in knowledge there are no immaculate conceptions. And the idea is that, you know, uh, we just have to do things in the way that we can do them. And it's perfectly possible, it's, it's, it's a great example, that sometimes the right way to go is to go to lower level and lower order and sometimes to higher level order. And as to your question how committed I am to this uh, uh, um, thing, well, I'm, I'm sort of committed to it as an example that makes a philosophical Point and also as an option that I think was not uh, uh, examined um, in the literature and I think should be examined in the literature. I also see it as a conjecture that has aspects that do belong, you know, in order to accept it, it is relevant what psychologists and others are saying. So there are many aspects of it. I feel that I myself have not investigated all these aspects enough to say that I looked and saw. But you know, I think that it is sort of relevant in, in, in a certain conception of knowledge that can, can do things that other theories cannot do, and also sort of putting it on the table. Yes, yeah, so in that case, I was wondering, so what's the reality in, then, and what's the positive? Because it looked look like in most of your examples, you were saying the positive was the um, level of individuals, and the reality was the properties. Right. Yeah, but the now, so now with the speed up types of theorems, it looks like it's it's the properties that are the realities, and it's 
No, and, uh, it's, and it's because those are the things that I think. I think we're okay. reaching the point where the discussion has to become uh, more. It can be held over coffee. I'm sorry. Where the discussion has to be accompanied by coffee. Co accompanied by coffee, exactly. Uh, I'd like to thank Gila for an excellent talk. <laughs> Thank you.